This is Wild of Africa, and I'm Eric Mzoka. Welcome to the program. On the show this week, even though Nigeria got a new president who will have to deal with a lot in his entry, including the economy and corruption, there's another addition to this list. Deaths associated with the rise of drug and substance abuse among the youth. We will talk about that shortly. We begin in Sudan, where the conflict between the country's army and the paramilitary group known as the Rapid Support Forces has lasted for a month now. And within that timeline, a mass exodus of people has been reported. Destruction of major infrastructure continues and the toll is rising. To add to the woes, the humanitarian situation is worsening. We on got the opportunity to speak to Doctors Without Borders or Medicine Sans Frontier, who have been operating in the country for over 40 years on why the world still needs to pay attention to the war-ravaged nation. Khartoum was relatively calmer as a seven-day ceasefire appeared to reduce fighting between two rival military factions, although it has not yet provided the promised humanitarian relief to millions trapped in the Sudanese capital. Those who remain in Khartoum are struggling for food, water and electricity, even phone network. Looters have ransacked homes, mostly in well-off neighbourhoods. A team of doctors from Doctors Without Borders have joined hands with local medical professionals to treat trauma patients in Khartoum. They have treated over 240 patients for trauma injuries since 9th May. No matter how um, intense a conflict is, no matter how high a death toll is, there is no human being who can ever get used to death, who can ever get used to the smell of dead bodies, to see their hospitals be riddled with bullets. Um, and it, everyone deserves a life of dignity, a life of safety, and to be able to sleep at night well rested, knowing that tomorrow there will be a peaceful day ahead of them. It is unlivable at the moment, and this is precisely why we need uh, the story of Sudan to be told and to be heard as much as possible today. Schools and hospitals are destroyed, as UN and aid agencies say that despite the truce, they have struggled to get the approvals and security guarantees to transport aid and staff. As MSF, we have been in Sudan for more than 40 years. We've been running medical projects in 10 states of Sudan. Um, and we've been attempting to scale up our medical activity since this intense fighting broke out between the Sudanese military and the rapid support forces last month. Um, but unfortunately, those efforts of ours and those of other actors in the space have been severely hampered by the violence, by aggressive armed incursions. There is looting or armed occupation happening at hospitals ourselves that we have witnessed ourselves. Um, we're facing a lot of administrative and logistical challenges. Intense fighting is also taking place in the city of Al-Fashir, capital of North Darfur state, which had remained calm in recent weeks after a separate local truce. Outside of Khartoum, the worst hit city is El Jenina, on the border with Chad, which has seen an onslaught of militia attacks that have destroyed its infrastructure and killed hundreds. The aid agencies are now making an appeal to the warring generals to stop the fight. Uh, those in the decision-making capacity, the leaders uh, involved in the conflict, need to ensure that there is safety for medical personnel and that health facilities or health officials, those carrying out health care, are not a target. The conflict, which erupted on 15th April, has killed at least 730 civilians and caused over 1 million Sudanese to leave their homes, fleeing either abroad or to safer parts of the country. Bureau Report, We On, World Is One. Rwanda is still trying to heal the wounds of the past when almost a million people were massacred to death in 1994. It became one of the worst genocides in modern history. And decades later, orchestrators of the violence and murders who either became fugitives or simply vanished are still being hunted. One such person who has been on the run is Fulgens Kayishema who was arrested recently in South Africa. Kai Shema is one of the last four remaining fugitives. But almost three decades later, will the country ever find closure? Only time will tell. On the run for two decades, Fulgens Kayashima was arrested from a grape farm in South Africa's Cape Town. One of Rwanda's most wanted suspects for the country's 1994 genocide 
Kayashima managed to evade justice for nearly 30 years. In 2001, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda indicted him for genocide over his alleged role in the destruction of the Nyange Catholic Church in Kibuye Prefecture. Kayashima has been on the U.S. State Department's wanted list under the Rewards for Justice program with a $5 million reward offered for his arrest. Kamanzi Innocent lost four members of his family when they were among a crowd of Tutsis killed by Hutus during Rwanda's genocide in 1994. He frequents this memorial site in Kibuye. Kamazi says he grew up with Kayashima, who is now in detention in South Africa and is likely to be extradited to Rwanda. This guy called Fulgens Kayashima, I know him. We grew up together in the same village and he is five years older than me. The reason I know him is because in Kivumu, there's not many educated people. I went to high school, but I didn't get a chance to go to university for two reasons. Because I was from Kibuye and I was a Tutsi. Naftali Ahishakie, executive secretary of Ibuka, an umbrella association of genocide survivors, says the arrest sends a strong message to other fugitives and masterminds of the 1994 genocide that they can never evade justice forever. Ahishakie calls for Kaishima to be extradited to Rwanda swiftly. Our wish is that it be judged and really fast and that we really avoid any obstacles or anything. As an organization of genocide survivors, we want him to be tried here in Kigali so that the victims and survivors can follow the trial. This is Nyange Genocide Memorial in Rwanda. Construction at the site is still going on. It is here that Hutu militia lobbed grenades, then doused it with fuel to set it ablaze. When that failed, they knocked down the church with bulldozers, and most of those sheltering inside died. Over 2,000 people lost their lives. The fugitive says he is sorry for the deaths, but denies any involvement in the genocide. After fleeing Rwanda, Felician Kabuga spent more than 20 years evading justice before his arrest in Paris in 2020. He is one of the last Rwandan genocide suspects to face justice, with 62 convicted by the tribunal so far. Kabuga's trial at a UN court is still going on, with prosecutors accusing the 87-year-old of setting up hate media that urged ethnic Hutus to kill rival Tutsis and supplying death squads with machetes. An estimated 800,000 ethnic Tutsis and Hutu moderates were killed during Rwanda's genocide orchestrated by an extremist Hutu regime and meticulously executed by local officials and ordinary citizens in the rigidly hierarchical society. Bureau Report, We On, World is One. Zimbabwe has been declared as the world's most miserable country according to the Hankes Annual Misery Index 2022. The index ranks countries based on how miserable they are and what the contributing factors are. Find out why Zimbabwe was ranked miserable in our next report. In the upcoming 2023 Zimbabwe polls, the stakes are high. As the country is going through one of its worst economic crises in recent times. Emerson Mnangagwa, who has been president since November of 2017, is expected to put in a bid for a second term, but is facing stiff opposition. Opposition leader Nelson Chamisa rallied the Citizens' Coalition for Change, the CCC, to win 19 out of the 28 seats in the parliamentary by-elections. Even though the ruling Zimbabwe African National Union Patriotic Front, ZANU-PF, still holds a parliamentary majority, analysts say CCC's success signals how it might perform in the 2023 presidential election. Recently, Zimbabwe has been named the most miserable country among 157 countries in the world, according to Steve Hunker's annual misery index. The index analyzes countries on the basis of their economic conditions. The African country that has surpassed war-torn nations like Ukraine, Syria and Sudan has majorly been plagued with skyrocketing inflation, which touched 243.8% last year. 
Last December, inflation peaked at 280%, one of the highest rates globally. The Zimbabwean dollar also weakened, trading at 930 to the US dollar in the parallel market. This led to plummeting living standards in the southern African country, where 7.9 million people, amounting to half of the population, fell into extreme poverty between 2011 to 2022. The International Monetary Fund, the IMF, predicts a further fall in the gross domestic product by 3.5% in 2023. As inflation soars, many in Harare are avoiding supermarkets and turning towards mobile and roadside sellers for their basic needs. It's cheaper for customers to buy from out here. For instance, for a dollar they can get two drinks, instead of one from a supermarket. It's also because our exchange rate is better than the official rate. Uh, we buy at the truck shop because they are cheap, their price is not even expensive. Because there, the big shops in these days, they are expensive. Even the rate, their rate is less. At the truck shop, they give us the good rates. That's why we prefer to go and buy the tax shop because they are cheap. Zimbabwe has endured years of fluctuating value of currencies, worsened by the adoption of trade in US dollars. Economists feel that the country is inching towards full dollarization as the local currency slumped by 34% in April alone. What we've witnessed over the past few weeks is a massive increase uh, in pricing, uh, Zim dollar pricing. Uh, this has largely been caused by the very significant depreciation of the local currency that we have seen on the black market or on the parallel market. Analysts say years of economic mismanagement under Zimbabwe's first leader, Robert Mugabe, and later under his predecessor, Mnangagwa, have stymied the economy, further exacerbated by hyperinflation and the currency devaluing rapidly. As the country gears up for the elections in July or August, Zimbabweans are feeling the heat of high cost of living. Inflation in the southern African country stands at over 131% in the month of May. Bureau Report, we are World is One. Drug use among Nigerian youths has become a growing concern in recent years. The statistics are alarming, with over 11% of young Nigerians engaging in the abuse of hard drugs such as syrup, tramadol, diazepam, cocaine, and shisha mix. Why is this proving to be a menace for authorities in the West African country? Our correspondent, Louisa Olani, sent us this report. Drug abuse among youths is a major concern in Nigeria. Marijuana is one of the most commonly abused substances among the youth, as Nigeria is the largest cannabis-producing country in West Africa. Other substances being abused include codeine, tramadol, and many illicit drugs. As the country commemorates the Mental Health Awareness Week, experts have called for deliberate efforts at addressing the growing drug menace. We at um, Grey Hub are dedicated to mitigating these issues. First of all, by providing psychosocial support, that is incorporating the family into the treatment. Now, you cannot treat someone and say, okay, I send you back into the world without providing a fallback for them. Now, they are going back into that world where they picked up drug use. So if you send them back without a plan, without a plan for engagement, they will fall back into the same drug use. This is available for students to be able to have that um, independent and unbiased and non-judgmental space to be able to express their emotions. So these are all the things that um, have led us to where we are now. And um, the drug thing is just very, very um, concerning. The National Drug Law Enforcement Agency reported that about 14.3 million Nigerians between the ages of 15 and 64 were estimated to have abused drugs in 2019, with a significant portion of them being youth. Experts describe the situation as a pandemic. In a world where the pressures of the daily life can feel overwhelming, it is essential to recognize and address the challenges faced by our youth. In today's world, anxiety is a common struggle that affects many young individuals. 
and they've called on the need for young people to open up, seek help, as seeking help is a sign of strength and not weakness. From Lagos, Nigeria, Louisa Olani Bion, World is One. Priests and lay worshippers in Ethiopia are on a mission to replicate or even recreate centuries-old religious manuscripts and sacred artwork in efforts to preserve traditions and heritage. How are they doing that? Find out in this next report. At this courtyard in Ethiopia's capital, workers stretch the goatskins tightly over metal frames to dry under a weak sun which barely pierces the milky sky. Once clean and dry, these skins are stripped of the goat hair and then cut to the desired size for use as pages of a book or for painting. After the goat skin is immersed in the water for three to four days, we make holes on the edge of the skin and tie it to the metal so that it can stretch. After that, we remove the extra layer of fat on the skin's interior to make it clean. Armed with a bamboo ink pen and a steady hand, Ethiopian Orthodox priest Zelale Mola carefully copies text in the ancient Gears language from a religious book onto a goatskin parchment. This painstaking task is preserving an ancient tradition. At the Hamare Berhan Institute in Addis Ababa, priests and lay worshippers work by hand to replicate sometimes centuries-old religious manuscripts and sacred artwork. Ancient parchment manuscripts are disappearing from our culture, which motivated us to start this project. Most of this literature can only be obtained in monasteries because only parchment manuscripts are used for chanting and prayers, not paper. However, this custom is rapidly fading and has become difficult for the monks. We thought if we could learn skills from our priests, we could work on it ourselves. So that is how we began. Like most other religious works, Zena Selassie is written in Gears. This dead language remains the language of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. And its alpha syllabic system, where the characters represent syllables, is still used to write Ethiopia's national language, Amharic as well as Tigrinya. It needs patience and focus. It is started with a prayer in the morning at lunchtime and ends with a prayer. It is difficult for an individual to write and finish a book, even to sit the whole day. But because of our devotion, a light shines brightly within us. The scribes use different pens for each color used in the text, black or red, and either a fine or broad tip with the inks made from various local plants. They are hoping that these recreated ancient transcripts will serve generations to come. Bureau Report, we on World is One. Those feeling lonely in South Africa now have a place to go. They have embraced the continent's first professional cuddling service where customers pay for platonic intimacy. Experts say isolation during the COVID pandemic, which hit South Africa the hardest, and stress from its struggling economy are just two reasons why the cuddling business is booming there. Here's a report. Who would have ever thought that hiring a professional cuddler for a momentary feeling of love and intimacy is a real option today? But it is. In South Africa, professional cuddling consultancies recently opened its doors. Florence Letzfolo started Pro Cuddlers last year after realizing the power of a cuddle when a really dreadful day at the office got the better of her. It is now gaining popularity. The owner says that they often hug strangers and acquaintances, so being cuddled is simply an extension of that. And it also allows clients the freedom to talk and open up in a safe environment. With the client, what we do, we verify their identity, that they are really who they say they are. So they need to provide some sort of ID, first time booking, that we verify that they, yes, it is Mr. So-and-so, as per their ID. And at any given time, we have their physical address, so we know exactly where they stay. Whether, even if they're at a hotel, we have their full address. The client and the cuddle may do not communicate at all. We don't exchange their numbers. 
we verify everything. We facilitate the booking process right up until the cuddle mate is at the client's door. According to several studies, physical contact enhances wellness. According to a study by a group of academics, touch reduces stress and allows the immune system to function better. It also suggests that touch can reduce stress and calm bodily functions such as heart rate and blood pressure. The study also found that gentle touch can reduce emotional pain and feelings of social exclusion. However, be it platonic or intimate, South Africans have various views about it and the cost. No African man can ever allow that. No African man. If you say, uh, I'm trying to order a cuddle for my little boy, no African man will make sense of that. My children is out of the house. I work more hours, so I'm dedicated to my work. And obviously, I've got my friends. At this age, you've got your set of friends. Until they pass on, maybe then I might be interested, but yeah, not at this stage. Well, depends on what kind of person is going to be giving me a cuddle. And you see, nowadays it's not safe. Yeah, I think it's insane, man. Because you would pop out 950 for something that you'd get for free. Generally from anybody, you could cuddle it with your mom and just hold it close and then hug her for an hour. I think that would be suitable. Operating in a country where sexual violence is rampant, the company has taken steps to ensure the safety of all participants. Let's Follow says that she had received calls from people asking for sexual services. But she said no such services were provided or sanctioned by the company. Bureau Report, Vion, World is One. And that's our show this week. Thank you for watching Wild of Africa with me, Eric Njoka. Find us on all our social media platforms. Your feedback is highly appreciated. Until next week, it is goodbye from me.